to this episode of I am Create, the I am Calcutta Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation webinar series that features successful I am Calcutta alum in the domain of entrepreneurship. I'm Professor Balram Avitatur and I coordinate the center. Entrepreneurial ventures launched by I am Calcutta alum have had substantial impact in India and around the world, creating millions of jobs with sizable revenues to spur economic and social development. The I Am Create channel celebrates their achievements and accomplishments. Our guest today is Professor Shankaran Venkatraman, who is the MasterCard Professor of Business Administration and the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Research at the Darden School, University of Virginia. He teaches MBA and executive level courses in strategy, entrepreneurship, and ethics. He is an internationally renowned scholar and educator in the field of entrepreneurship. He has published extensively and has lectured around the world. He has earned the Outstanding Faculty Award at Darden, the Academy of Management, the largest professional body of management educators in the world, has recognized his research by awarding him the inaugural IDEA Award for Foundational Research in Entrepreneurship. And in 2010, the Academy of Management Review a leading journal of the academy cited one of his papers as the most influential in the past decade from among the papers published in that journal. Professor Venkat is a 1982 MBA from I am Calcutta. He did his PhD from University of Minnesota. Very importantly, he was awarded the IMC Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2020. Our immense pleasure to welcome Professor Venkat to this episode. With me is Professor Anirwan Pant of the Strategic Management Group. So I will start off the first question and, and, uh, and the subsequent questions will be by Professor Pant. So my question to you, Professor Venkat, is through your scholarly writings and service, you have been instrumental in shaping the distinctive domain of the academic field of entrepreneurship. Can you describe how that played out over the 1990s and the 2000s? First of all, uh, Balram and uh, Anirvan, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, series. Uh, it's my both privilege and honor. And uh, coming back to IMC through this uh, process is a, a very, very happy occasion for me. Um, you know, Balram, uh, when you write something, you don't expect, uh, you don't focus on the uh, consequences or outcomes. Uh, honestly, when I wrote the first paper in the distinctive domain, and then when Scott Shane, uh, my doctoral student uh, at that time, of course, and I collaborated on the, uh, the next paper, which was published in uh, AMR, Academy of Management Review, um, The Promise of Entrepreneurship. Uh, we really had no idea, at least I had no idea that uh, uh, there were things there that we, people would find uh, uh, interesting or uh, uh, even, you know, lines of research that uh, they could pursue. Um, so when I first, the distinctive domain paper, when I wrote it, I was writing it for more or less myself. Um, so in a sense, you have to go back to the 80s and uh, uh, the early 90s. Entrepreneurship was just, uh, you know, it was a nascent field. Um, it was looking more at other fields such as strategy, uh, to some extent, economics, sociology, psychology, um, people who are talking about entrepreneurs mainly and their actions um, and the firms that they started. Um, so there were many voices, they were all disparate. Um, so in a sense, I was trying to make sense of uh, what is this field about? What is it that might uh, bring it together or unite it? Um, so I was concerned about what might be some interesting questions to ask that comes out of entrepreneurship. That was the spirit with which, um, you know, I wrote the paper. And of course, when you write a paper, you think there are some interesting lines <laughs> uh, of thought uh, or some interesting avenues that you could take. But what people found surprising or interesting was very surprising to me. I never expected uh, um, eventually where the field went and how it went. And I think... Uh, the way that paper and the subsequent paper was taken was uh, uh, people found the opportunity, if I could call it the opportunity construct, um, as the interesting one emerging out of that paper. Um, and uh, I think, as you know, the, the history of that, 
Um, lots and lots of papers have been written about uh, the construct of opportunity. Not all of them have been uh, profitable or useful. <laughs> Uh, some people have found the construct to lead to dead ends. Others said this is this is the future of entrepreneurship. Um, so there has certainly been a lot of citations to the paper. Um, I have certainly been fortunate. Um, it has launched many doctoral dissertations. Um, there were um, whole avenues of research around the construct of opportunity. Um, so in that sense, it is quite gratifying. Um, happy to play have played a part in. Uh, the field sort of coalescing around, uh, you know, two or three issues. Um, so that's what I feel uh, happened as a result of that paper. Yeah. So if we if we think of the concept of opportunity, which as you pointed out, your paper on the distinctive domain of entrepreneurship did a lot to bring attention to. And if we think of uh, strategies, uh, interest in the idea of advantage, uh, at least at a metaphorical level, uh, advantage and opportunity seem like symmetrical concepts. Uh, to a certain extent, then it would seem natural that strategy and entrepreneurship are viewed as uh, contiguous areas of study, if not overlapping. Uh, could you give us a sense of how the, uh, the disciplinary boundaries of entrepreneurship got shaped in these years, uh, both through your work as well as the work of your colleagues and peers. And how is it that we came to regard entrepreneurship as an important and quite independent field of study within the broader area of uh, management? Yeah, those are good questions, uh, Anirvan. Uh, let me take the concept of opportunity first. And then I will try and uh, link it with uh, strategy. Uh, it's interesting you point out that opportunity and advantage uh, might be sister concepts, if I could put it that way. Uh, I had never thought of it that way, but that's an interesting line to uh, pursue. Um, the construct of opportunity, when I first uh, you know, uh, expressed it, uh, if I could put it that way, in the paper, the idea actually came from Peter Drucker. Um, when I read his book, Innovation Entrepreneurship, which is a um, relatively speaking, uh, given the number of books he's written, his books are very thick. <laughs> the uh, Innovation Entrepreneurship uh, book is not that thick. It's a very accessible book. It's delightfully written. Somehow, um, you know, our academic colleagues don't uh, discount uh, Peter Drucker and don't read him enough. But I found his ideas across the board to be just absolutely full of theory and uh, insight, wisdom. So in that book, uh, he talks about opportunity as an independent construct. And that's what I found fascinating. And that's what I wanted to focus on, that you can treat the notion of opportunity independent of firms and entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a tendency in entrepreneurship literature and perhaps even in strategy literature to treat opportunity as, a, as an endogenous uh, construct. Uh, where we keep the entrepreneur and the opportunity together, tied together, tethered to each other. Uh, whereas Peter Drucker spoke about opportunity as an exogenous concept. That is to look at opportunity in and of itself. And I think that actually comes directly from Schumpeter. Schumpeter talked about five different forces which lead to uh, you know, opportunities for innovation, um, new technologies, new markets, uh, discoveries of new uh, markets or uh, populations, uh, new means of production, new channels of distribution. So he had those categories. And um, I think Peter Drucker was similarly articulating from an entrepreneurship and innovation perspective, there are these categories, there are these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, independent things that arise in society, which then become the foundations for new ideas that can be then um, you know, captured or uh, embedded or encapsulated by um, firms and entrepreneurs. That was the notion that I wrote the distinct domain, said we should pay attention to opportunities. Um, it was similar to uh, the construct of industry in industrial economics, in strategy, even in marketing. If you think about it, the notion of industry was a breakthrough concept for all of those fields. 
And uh, in, in strategy, you know, Porter's work came directly out of that. In marketing, the whole idea of uh, uh, the um, uh, PIMS database, the profit impact of market share, right? Those were all came directly out of the notions of industry. So I thought that opportunity construct would similarly be the kind of breakthrough concept for uh, entrepreneurship. And if you could conceptualize that independently, then you could ask some interesting questions about uh, opportunity. Of course, there is always this definitional notion of how do you define an opportunity? Uh, but the economists and the strategists didn't worry too much about defining industry. Yeah, some categories were given, they, they just went along. And uh, the important notion was drawing some boundaries around which you could do research. That possibility was there in entrepreneurship. Somehow that did not get traction and people did not pay attention to opportunity as an exogenous variable out there independent and um, draw some boundaries around it. Then you could ask interesting questions because we ask questions of the following in entrepreneurship. Why are some societies more entrepreneurial than others? Why are some regions more entrepreneurial than others? Why are some firms more entrepreneurial than others? Why are some cultures more entrepreneurship than others? Why are some, uh, um, e even in India, certain kinds of groups we say are more entrepreneurial than others, right? What are these constructs? These are exogenous independent constructs around which we ask interesting questions. What is it that makes some firms more entrepreneurial? So I thought that could be a you know, notion around opportunity. Why do some opportunities lend themselves for more entrepreneurial activities compared to others? Um, that was the notion with which I wrote it. Then you could tether the entrepreneur and firms to this notion of opportunity. That's what I call the nexus of the two. Uh, given the same opportunity, there might be a variety of different entrepreneurial actions. People may look at the same opportunity and come up with very different ideas. And then you could construct a good theory around that, a good set of frameworks and a good set of empirical uh, uh, findings, arguments, et cetera. Instead, the field took it away in the direction of our opportunities created or found, is it subjective or objective? <laughs> what is an opportunity? Yeah. You know, um, uh, can you really talk about opportunity? You can only talk about ventures, et cetera. That is because we were not willing to give up this notion of putting entrepreneur into back into every question, which I thought was a missed opportunity, if I could put it that way. Uh, so that's my, uh, uh, you know, thinking about uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, now, coming back to strategy, um, more than advantage, uh, Anirvan, I would say it's a notion of industry that I see the connection between the two. Uh, for me, that was the real connection with strategy. But having said that, I would say that uh, um, you know, I teach in the area of strategy, ethics, and entrepreneurship. And um, and I, the reason I teach in that area, the reason we have put it together in uh, in Darden that way is, I see these three as uh, three phases of a prism, if you will. And all three are important to get a full picture of of business or organization. I like to think of entrepreneurship as uh, uh, as as concerned with the origin of value, the original ideas for how value can be created. Where do those uh, initial foundational uh, imprinting ideas come from? That's the domain of entrepreneurship. I see strategy as maintaining or growing value within a competitive uh, context. Right, So it continues the story, if you will. And I see ethics as um, value distribution. Is it fair? Is it just? Um, the, the, is value, does value go to the people who produce it? Um, and the second notion from, from ethics is, um, how is this value created? Does it you know, uh, uh, meet our sense of uh, uh, good uh, practice, uh, fair practices and things of that kind? So to me, entrepreneurship strategy and ethics are all deeply connected. There are three sides of value creation and uh, value maintenance and value growth and value distribution. In that sense, I think all of them are uh, uh, sister disciplines. They can learn a lot from each other. Uh, one in like a, one hands off to the other field um, and uh, ethics puts the governance structure around uh, the other two disciplines. Thank you. That was uh, very interesting. So uh, let me just go back to uh, some of your thoughts around the construct of opportunity. And 
one of the things that uh, delighted me about the distinctive domain and the promise article articles is that uh, you were able to uh, and you did explicitly point this out you were able to liberate the idea from the human agent of the entrepreneur and then uh, you actually linked across a vast vast landscape of literature schumpeter through kurzner and others down to uh, some of the more practice oriented research as well uh, if we look at the concept of opportunity for a little bit um, for a, a, to a certain uh, deeper extent can we then uh, think of opportunity more as a uh, you compared it to industry for strategy and i found that very useful can we think of it more as a as a conven a convening anchor so to speak rather than a uh, a boundary closer a industries have been used uh, more in the sense of categories in strategy uh, entrepreneurship uh, unless we go down the creation versus discovery path has uh, had a massive flowering of research and yes there has been a lot of the creation discovery as well so it, is opportunity then an anchor or should we rethink and stick to a boundaries notion for the field of entrepreneurship yeah i think it could be both huh? that's my initial uh, reactions without boundary conditions it is difficult to make uh, uh, certain kinds of statements which lend themselves to empirical traction um and you you know you really cannot uh, uh, what does it apply to is it testable <laughs> uh, on, on some dimensions of uh, um methodological uh, requirements uh, can you make statements which are you know uh, at least from a objectivist uh, philosophy uh, falsifiable uh, which are important for certain kinds of questions so in that sense i think drawing boundary conditions make the makes the theory sharper uh, makes our statements uh, verifiable uh, so i think from that sense uh, boundary conditions are important um, but the usefulness of a construct comes not from its testability the usefulness of a construct comes from what can we do with it why is this construct make us a better um, practitioner a uh, better society in that sense i think uh, a construct should be judged by different sets of criteria if you will um, then simply boundary conditions so in that way i would say uh, both are important the construct is only useful to the extent that it uh, gives you generalizability so the more you can anchor it the more you can generalize but the construct is only so useful that you can say something that you can make clearly say this applies to some things from that sense you are trying to balance generalizability uh, with certain amount of parsimony and uh, accuracy so when i put those conditions together i would say um, a good construct is something that is robust and can apply to a lot of uh, uh, areas uh, while at the same time it gives you a clear course of action um, that's the trade off i think uh, we all struggle with um, so where does opportunity come into this i think there are people who will say opportunity is not sharp enough that i can draw boundary condition therefore it is vague and i find it difficult to deal with um and on the other side uh, people say the opportunity seems to apply to a lot of things we don't know what is <laughs> it is not an opportunity uh, or it will fall into into that trap as well so how do i solve the problem so i would solve the problem as you know uh, pragmatically just use start somewhere you use some categories and uh, launch your research um, and that itself will lead to some good anchor points if you will from there on uh, what do i mean by that i mean it's easy you can say that uh, opportunities are nothing but certain categories of uh, creations or inventions you could say social media is an opportunity we will immediately recognize that you could say artificial intelligence is an opportunity you could say 
Internet is an opportunity. Those are convenient categories. They give you boundary conditions. They give you a certain sense of directions. You can compare these three. What is the nature of the opportunities of social media versus artificial intelligence versus internet? How are they similar? How are they different? Is one more conducive for entrepreneurship than another? I can ask a variety of different questions, but that itself gives us then some guiding directions about stepping back and thinking about opportunity itself as a construct. How can we define it? Can we categorize opportunities? Are there some useful ways of talking about opportunities as criteria for some other outcomes, et cetera? So that's how I would think about it. Um, I hope it makes sense. <laughs> it does. Thank you very much. One of the abiding debates in the field of management, one that keeps regenerating itself every few years is the rigor versus relevance debate. Uh, as management academics do more to make their research rigorous, uh, are they making it less relevant? Goes one strand of this debate. There are, of course, many other strands. From the perspective of the academic field of entrepreneurship, uh, and your uh, your perspective as both uh, uh, you know pioneering participant as well as an observer uh, for decades how would you place the field of entrepreneurship amidst this debate rigor versus relevance what would your perspective be i think entrepreneurship started as a relevant field uh, because uh, the questions people were asking were primarily led by uh, the phenomenon, if you will. You know, most of the early scholars came from um, wanting to uh, understand and describe and uh, uh, prescribe uh, the entrepreneurship side. So they did not, at least in the management field, they did not approach it from the literature, but they approached it from the phenomenon. So to some extent, it uh, came from the relevant side, if you will. Uh, there were demands for teaching entrepreneurship in the universities or in business schools. Students were interested in uh, taking those courses and, uh, you know, using it for their own uh, ends. Um, so it naturally started as a relevant field. Um, but as always, when you're a university, you, you want uh, legitimacy. <laughs> uh, if you want to perpetuate yourself, if you want to attract resources, um, you've got to satisfy the conditions of academia. And the criteria and the conditions of academia were, uh, where's the literature, where's the theory? Um, how can you make these statements without some notions of uh, your teaching uh, verified, tested, legitimate uh, ideas? So that pushed the field towards, uh, if you can call it that rigor, uh, it is not so much uh, rigor as I would say, the search for connecting it to established ideas and theories and frameworks and models coming out of academia rather than just keeping it within the uh, the practice field. So I think that's what pushed the field towards, uh, uh, I suppose you could say rigor. As to the question of rigor versus relevance, I think we should remove the word uh, versus and replace it with uh, and, because I think um, a, a, a theory or rigor is, if it doesn't speak about the world, um, then what is it for? You know, is it for some private individuals to uh, satisfy their own intellectual uh, aspects? Then I think from a societal point of view, there's not enough value. Uh, so a good theory is one that should be eminently relevant. And um, if relevance, if you do not have some notions of being able to talk to other related, connected disciplines and fields, um, then I think from a relevance point of view, you have not fully explored the possibilities. So in that sense, what uh, rigor gives you is a, a language, a set of, uh, um, you know, grammar uh, to be able to connect it to other fields of thought. Um, that's the value of rigor, I think. The value of rigor is not to be able to make statements with some certain confidence and assurance. The value of rigor is is having the language and the grammar to be able to talk to other disciplines in a way that uh, the disciplines can understand each other and fully explore the possibilities of the world. 
that's why I think the two are connected and uh, important for each other. That actually uh, helps us think about a very specific aspect of your contribution over the years, uh, which I realized uh, as I was uh, preparing for our conversation with you, is that you also had an immense uh, impact on how doctoral curriculum in the field of entrepreneurship got shaped in its early years as the academic field was getting shaped. Uh, you were part of a group of your peers that had very specific recommendations on this theme, including in your uh, 2003 Journal of Management piece, if I remember right. Uh, today, as you look back nearly 20 years later, uh, how do you feel about these recommendations and is there something that's more salient than other bits for you? Is there something that you change uh, in how you and your colleagues looked at the doctoral curriculum for entrepreneurship in those years? Um, yeah, the, I think that paper was written when uh, we had a doctoral uh, committee uh, in the Academy of Management Entrepreneurship Division. Um, there were several of us, we had several conversations. Uh, uh, in all fairness, there were a, a few others who took the uh, responsibility of uh, taking these ideas and putting together in the form of a paper. So I would uh, thank those, um, um, you know, the authors who are listed in the earlier, uh, uh, um, you know, the line of authorship there. Um, we did explore, um, if you go back uh, in the 90s, there were no doctoral programs in entrepreneurship. Most of the uh, entrepreneurship scholars came from strategy for the most part, uh, to some extent from organization behavior and organization theory. Uh, but there was an academy a division in entrepreneurship. And as I said, that division came about mainly because of the phenomena. Uh, most of us were uh, professors who were teaching a course in entrepreneurship, but we also had uh, teaching responsibilities in other fields such as strategy or management or uh, organization behavior. But the uh, academy division pulled us together as, uh, as, as an, you know, we, we became a visible college from an invisible college. We were individuals in our own little uh, uh, schools. So we were struggling with, if we had to put an entrepreneurship curriculum together for, uh, uh, you know, for a doctoral program, what would that be? That was the genesis of it. Um, then we, you know, we thought about what would be the reading packages, what should be the um, way in which we would take this forward. Uh, and um, that was what we struggled with. So if I fast forward to now, you know, it, it's completely day and night. I suppose we, we look more like many other fields in management. May not, may not be as advanced as some of our more older disciplines, but certainly we can compare ourselves to feels like um, strategy for sure, um, information technology, MIS, and those kinds of uh, fields were also coming up at the same time as entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the field of entrepreneurship in the early days was more concerned about entrepreneurs and uh, startups venturing to some extent uh, firms. And those are the subject matters of dissertations or curriculum. Fast forward to today, um, entrepreneurship is almost like a, a nexus, a uh, hub for a lot of other fields. You have finance, you have marketing, of course you have strategy, but you have uh, management, you have psychology, you have sociology, all coming together in um, entrepreneurship. So in that sense, what has happened is the uh, field of entrepreneurship has become more of a hub and spoke kind of a uh, situation. You, you can, uh, um, I think that's a sign of maturity. Uh, it's also a sign of uh, what a robust field that is. Um, in some senses, entrepreneurship is an application area for uh, um, other disciplines. In another sense, entrepreneurship can borrow rich theories from those fields and apply it to uh, uh, you know, the central phenomenon of interest in this particular uh, field. Um, so I think that makes it a very interesting kind of pasture, if you will, for, uh, uh, for the doctoral uh, program. So which means it has both. Um, you have to be careful how you construct the program. It can get very confusing. 
uh, it can get um, somewhat unwieldy. Um, so to some extent, a good doctoral program now has to make some choices. Uh, they have to make some choices around, you know, around what kind of disciplines do we build ourselves? Um, and those become the interesting questions. Um, and both possibilities are there. You can make a multidisciplinary field, uh, or you could say that I'm interested in certain aspects of entrepreneurship within a discipline. So I think that's the big difference I see today than say 20 years ago uh, when that paper was conceptualized. What would your own leaning be if I might ask on this question? I, I, yeah. I, I, my leaning would be, my bias would be towards multidisciplinary. Because if you go back, you mentioned this in, a, in passing in your opening comments um, in the distinctive domain paper, how I brought different strands together. Yeah. That has always been my bias. I think my mind works uh, better when it tries to synthesize. <laughs> uh, I think I have the synthetic capability if I were to reflect and you know analyze myself, which you should not do. <laughs> Uh, could get you into trouble. Uh, but if I were to ask myself, uh, where am I to your question of comparative advantage, I think my comparative advantage is in synthesis. So I would feel more comfortable in a multidisciplinary setting where uh, I could take different aspects and bring it to the phenomena. I would, my bias would be there. The other reason I say multidisciplinary is uh, I think breakthrough innovations and inventions come in the uh, you know, in the uh, intersection of different disciplines. That's where the magic happens. That's where you can create um, new value. Um, so uh, my bias would be towards inter multidisciplinary, acknowledging that you can go deep and you can, um, you can do a lot of great things there as well. Yeah. That's interesting. And I, I understand that uh, as you frame it, this is your own bias. We all have our own biases. But that's particularly interesting because uh, uh, perhaps in uh, several parts of management, including uh, strategy, we uh, do not have a premium on the skill of synthesis. And by synthesis, I don't mean the skill that one necessarily uses in a literature review, but the capacity for true conceptual synthesis spanning very broad domains. Uh, to that extent, if we were to project your bias, as you called it, onto the possible and emerging field of entrepreneurship, perhaps entrepreneurship is a renaissance field of uh, management. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if there is a certain uh, kind of cognitive uh, approach or perspective that goes hand in hand here that links doctoral curriculum and the practicing manager. And I'm reminded of one of these concepts that uh, you uh, have authored uh, with other colleagues, including Saras Saraswati, the idea of the entrepreneurial method. Uh, is that something that uh, we should pay attention to today? Yes, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial method, method um, or the method of entrepreneurship uh, is, a, I think, it's a deep question in the sense that it, uh, um, it's a fertile field. Um, much like the scientific method was a breakthrough um, way back. Um, and, you know, in a scientific method has certain kinds of, uh, uh, I suppose, processes uh, things that you would do, um, observation, generating hypotheses, um, designing, um, you know, met experiments or uh, um, testing, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you could say that uh, one way of conceptualizing entrepreneurship, it's a way of society to uh, um, bring new things into existence. And uh, it could take a corresponding uh, approach. Then you could say entrepreneurship itself can be conceptualized as a method. And if you conceptualize it as a method, then I think uh, you observe the entrepreneurs, you study the entrepreneurs, and then you can deconstruct what they do. And then you codify it, you, you reconstruct it. The benefit of doing that 
is then you can then teach it. Uh, you can practice it in some systematic and method, uh, methodical ways. That's the possibility. Uh, why might it be important? Much like the scientific method was important uh, for progress, for solving problems, um, the entrepreneurship method could, could have similar possibilities. That's the idea. Um, so how can I make this concrete? Um, let me take one simple example. Um, in America, we talk a lot about this notion of bootstrapping as an important um, idea in entrepreneurship. You could always conceptualize it as a method of starting something and um, going from a zero base to something positive. In India, you talk about Jugaad. Jugaad is a method. You could deconstruct it, codify it, reconstruct it, and teach it. Uh, the French talk about uh, bricolage. Um, it's a Silicon Valley uh, talks about as uh, you know lean, the lean method, a lean startup. What are these things except a notion of a method? Agile. It's a notion of a method. In that sense, I think um, entrepreneurship can be conceptualized as a method, and then you would teach it. Who would you teach it to? Well, you teach science to everyone, not because you want all of society to become scientists, but it's an important way of thinking and reasoning, a mindset, which allows you to you know, create value in the world, solve problems in the world. You teach mathematics to uh, everybody. You do that not because you want everybody's going to become a mathematician or a physicist. You teach it because it's fundamental to you know, what it means to be a human being. We teach ethics to everyone, either implicitly or explicitly. Why? It's because we believe that it's fundamental for to be a you know, um, contributing whole uh, person. Uh, that's the ultimate argument uh, I think uh, Saras and I are trying to make, uh, among many others. Uh, that if you conceptualize entrepreneurship as a method, it might get you to a mindset and a thought process and a way of problem solving, which might be distinctly different and adds to our repertoire as a human being. And that can be very valuable. Um, and that's the promise. Would it be fair to infer that uh, this also uh, emphasizes the role of observation as a scientific skill that might perhaps been uh, underplayed in recent years, uh, well, not in uh, recent years, really, but as management kind of consolidated around uh, the hypothetical deductive method. Uh, is observation something that we should renew, refresh, and uh, bring to the center? For sure, yeah, I would uh, agree with that. Uh, no question about that. Um, and the whole notion of observing, describing, um, without certain preconditional um, sets of uh, boxes. <laughs> um, and I think that's what Saras calls effectuation. So the causal method is um, having a goal in mind and then you know, working backwards to say, how would I achieve it? So what are the steps I should take to achieve the goal? Why don't you take the opposite, which is suspend the goal and just start with what you already have uh, who you are, what you know, who you know, and what you have. Those four starting points are sufficient to create a world in the future where you don't know where it will lead and where it will go. Um, obviously, that's one way of talking about the method. Um, just flip um, the causal uh, or flip the 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 broadly understood notion of the scientific uh, method, um, then entrepreneurship is contributing something. If you can, uh, if you can conceptualize that, codify that, and then show that it is useful, um, then I think uh, uh, it'll be great. Now, you you said observation. Um, I would elaborate it to say that uh, um, action. First, take action then worry about the results. <laughs> Rather than worrying about the outcome and then trying to uh, uh, 
take action. Um, so observation is one way uh, of uh, conceptualizing it. Action is another way of uh, uh, conceptualizing. Um, so I think those are some, uh, you know, uh, ways in which we could take this, uh, uh, take this forward. And why, why is that important? It's important not because you want to make everyone an entrepreneur. The, the objective of teaching on, you know, method or conceptualizing method, you know, slight in other ways or different ways, uh, is not to make everyone an entrepreneur. Much like it's the, the objective of teaching mathematics is not to make everyone a mathematician. It is important to appreciate entrepreneurship because you can participate in in a world where there is a lot of entrepreneurship. What does that mean? It means you could be an entrepreneur yourself, yes, or you could support entrepreneurship. You could be an investor in an entrepreneurial venture. If you understand the entrepreneurial method and if you appreciate entrepreneurship, um, you're inclined to support it. You could help an entrepreneur. If you are in a firm and you're a manager, you could give a chance to a young entrepreneur as a customer. If you're a purchase department, you could give a chance to a young entrepreneur as a purchasing manager. If you appreciate entrepreneurship, you're more biased and inclined to do that. That has positive value in society. Why? Because giving chances to young entrepreneurs is, is the option for society. You could test more ideas, more entrepreneurs, more things. Right? In that sense, it is uh, wonderful. You would give failure a chance. If somebody fails, you would not stigmatize it. Because action is very important for discovering new ideas, for creating new ideas. That's the benefit for uh, society. People would not fear failure. It, it's not so much even fearing failure as uh, um, the bigger fear as cognitive psychology is, uh, behavioral psychology is uh, shown to us. It's the fear of losing what we already have that prevents us from doing something new. But if people understood entrepreneurship, we would release those kinds of fears that we have, the biases that we have, which I think net net is good for uh, progress in society. We, we, we would discover things faster. We, uh, we would uh, we would abandon poor ideas faster. We would not fear those kinds of things. We would fail faster, cheaper, smarter, <laughs> uh, and so on. Um, which I think all comes with this idea of the entrepreneurial method as being different from the causal method, which is what I think I find uh, uh, powerful. Um, I, I'm rambling a bit here, I think, but uh, no, no, uh, not I'm trying to connect disparate ideas here. Yeah. Thank you. I, I actually found your uh, uh, your uh, observations very useful. And going back to some of your earlier comments around the uh, the normative aspect, the ethics of entrepreneurship or of management in general, and also you mentioned earlier that deeply uh, pragmatic implications. I think you've kind of put it all together for us. Uh, I think Balram, there's a good time to pause. We can continue this conversation with Professor Venkat Raman for a long while, but uh, Professor Venkat Raman has really summarized some of the uh, implications of entrepreneurship for society and why we should regard entrepreneurship as a good uh, a force for good. Uh, and I think there's a good time to pause unless you have some further observations or questions. No, at this time, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this allows me uh, a way to reach uh, many IMC alumni and perhaps uh, other people as well. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and hopefully it'll lead to some good outcomes. <laughs> Yeah, Professor Venkat, uh, I found your uh, your interview fantastic. Uh, the uh, it was very much like when I heard you first time uh, one or two years back. Uh, it was really great having you, and very valuable insights, scholarly insights on entrepreneurship. We are sure our students will benefit tremendously from these insights, and uh, very importantly, we are. Very proud of you as our alumnus. And on behalf of CEI and I am Kolkata, I wish to thank you for being our guest and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.